And good afternoon, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lieutenant General John Whistler, who is our Marine Corps, uh, strongest Marine Corps component to the Stockdale Center here, our, our Commandant of Midshipmen, who I believe is, uh, is on his way over, uh, Captain T.R. Buchanan, our uh, Deputy Commandant of Midshipmen, uh, Captain Mathewson, our Stockdale Center Deputy Director, uh, Jeff McCreese, and all of you who are our distinguished guests, and especially our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Ryan Holiday. Thank you for being here today. My name is Rear Admiral Blues Baker, and I have the honor of serving the Naval Academy as the Director of Influencer Development at the Naval Academy's Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And on behalf of our Center Director, Dr. Joe Thomas, I would like to welcome you to our Honor, Courage, and Commitment Luncheon. The Stockdale Center's vision, its, its mission is to empower leaders to make courageous ethical decisions. And we envision this lunch to do a couple things that are gonna contribute directly to that mission. And we designed this seminar series to accomplish the following objectives because as you know, we always have objectives, correct? Here they are. We wanna provide a unique, hospitable, enjoyable venue, and we hope this is what you're having today, to listen to accomplished leaders from diverse professional backgrounds as they address the, the core values of honor and courage and commitment. Second is we want our attendees nominated by their supervisors, by their cost centers for this luncheon because this selection process allows us to not only listen to our guest speaker, but also engage in purposeful dialogue, and also enjoy time at our table with one another. Third, we want to invite midshipmen and faculty and staff and coaches to encourage interaction with one another as key elements of our Naval Academy community. We're, uh, we're breaking down any stovepipes through, through this luncheon today to be able to have time together at the table. Finally, we're gonna send you away, hopefully not only full, but inspired and challenged and instructed in some ways to be prepared yourself to courageously lead in an extraordinary manner. This luncheon series today was made possible through the generous gift of Dr. and Mrs. Ernst Volgenau. Dr. Volgenau is a 1955 graduate of the Naval Academy. He's a former Air Force officer who helped develop space boosters, satellites, computer systems, and taught in the field of astronautics. He's the founder of SRA International Incorporated, an information technology firm of about 6,000 people, which was listed on the New York Stock Exchange from 2002 to 2011. And then combined with several divisions of Computer Sciences Corporation, CSC, which formed CSRA. So for 10 years in a row, SRA was on the Fortune Magazine's list of the 100 best places to work in the United States. His wife, Sarah Volgenau, is a 1957 graduate of Moorhead State University and taught in elementary schools for several years. So Dr. and Mrs. Volgenau have three married daughters, they have nine grandchildren, and we today are beneficiaries of their uh, very gracious investment in you at the Naval Academy. So we're honored to have as our guest speaker today, Mr. Ryan Holliday. Fewer, uh, few of us, I should say, uh, and few writers have, have done as much to bring uh, ancient and timeless wisdom and couple that with cutting edge marketing strategies and uh, putting that all together than, than Ryan Holiday has been able to do. His philosophically driven best-selling books have, have, have sold uh, two million copies, uh, nearly two million if, if not over that right now. They're, they have directly influenced uh, Super Bowl winning teams like the New England Patriots, uh, World Series champions like the uh, Houston Astros, uh, Olympic gold medalists. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we'll drop that one. Before they were cheated. Yes. As well as senators and military leaders and some of the biggest and most important companies in the world, like Google and Twitter and Microsoft. So listen, at the core of this teaching, of Ryan's teaching, is, is what's called stoicism. It's a philosophy that he's brought back uh, to this generation from ancient Rome 
and into the workplace, into uh, entrepreneurship, into politics, into sports, and into the military. So what is Stoicism, folks? Well, for those of you who have taken uh, any 203, you'd know that uh, it's the idea that while we cannot always control what happens to us in life, we can control and we always can control the way we respond to what happens. And it's this message, it's a framework for overcoming obstacles, for scaling new challenges, for battling both the ups and the downs of life that has brought Ryan uh, to the front of some of the most influential audiences in the world, including you today, right? So we're very fortunate to have Mr. Holiday with us this afternoon. Oh, please join me in giving him a very strong Go Navy welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, point this here. Are we working? Sorry about that. That's not it. <laughs> Will they pull it up? Uh, this, is what, this is the question I'm going to start with. Uh, I'm sure the chaplain can answer this, but who here can name the four cardinal virtues? I bet you can. It's your job. <laughs> uh, let's go back. All right, the four cardinal virtues. Anyone know them? Correct. Uh, I render them as courage, temperance, or moderation, justice, and wisdom. What's interesting about these four virtues, these are the four virtues of, of Stoicism, which is what I write about, but they also happen to be the four virtues in Aristotle. They're the four virtues in Christianity. Actually, uh, the, when, when people hear cardinal virtues, they, they think uh, uh, religion, cardinals. Um, car cardinal comes from the Latin cardos, which just means uh, hinge. So the reason they're the four virtues is because they are the sort of pivotal virtues of life. And so what I'm interested in, what I try to focus on in my writing is, is where do the ancients, where do the sort of wisest people who live, where do they overlap across schools, disciplines, religions, philosophers, where, where do we find agreement or common ground? And so again, the cardinal virtues are something that uh, there, there are almost no uh, philosophical schools that say courage is a bad thing, that you should not try to be wise, uh, that actually moderation is, is, you know, is, is to be avoided. Um, so when, when the world, uh, when the ancient world agrees, we, we would do well to listen. And I think what the, the purpose of those four cardinal virtues, whether you're thinking about it religiously or philosophically, what they're there for is to help us answer some of those critical questions of life, right? How to live. What is our duty? What is right? What does the good life look like? Uh, and as Marcus Aurelius says, if at some point in your life you should come across anything better than justice, truth, self-control, and courage, it must be an extraordinary thing indeed. And I've yet to find in all of my research and all of my reading and all of my experience anything better than these four virtues. And so we're going to talk about these cardinal virtues today. We're going to talk about how they apply, how we can try to use them. And, and hopefully, uh, as I was telling my table, what I try to do is illustrate ideas like this with stories. What does it look like in the real world? Um, Epictetus, uh, this would be uh, Stockdale's favorite philosopher, said, don't talk about your philosophy, embody it, right? So who are the people who have embodied these ideas? How do we apply philosophy in the real world? whether you're a midshipman or a pilot or a CEO or a president or a parent. How do you apply these things in the real world? This is what philosophy is, is actually designed to do. Um, so I'll start with a you know, fellow Navy officer. Um, in 1962, Kennedy goes to bed. He's president of the United States. And he wakes up the next morning. And the, the balance of power in the world has, has shifted overnight. The CIA discovers a number of missile sites on the island of Cuba that were put there by Russia. Um, at the time, actually, uh, Kennedy is under the impression only that the missile sites are under construction. What makes the whole thing more terrifying in retrospect is actually not only were they operational, but the people on the ground had some authority to use these nuclear weapons. And so this moment, uh, when we talk about uh, moderation, when we talk about wisdom, when we talk about courage, talk about prudence, 
Um, it is for precisely situations like this where the weight of the world is, is almost literally on a single man's shoulders. Uh, this is Kennedy in the Oval Office during the missile crisis. And you can imagine just uh, the, the, the enormous and horrifying stakes that he's, he's having to think about here. Uh, estimates are uh, conservatively that 60 million people would die if nuclear war would break out between uh, the United States and the USSR. Um, and what's, what's, I think, most interesting about this is even though those are appa the appalling stakes, the advice that Kennedy gets from his advisors is that he essentially has no choice. Uh, we have to bomb Cuba, then launch an invasion of Cuba, and then uh, quite possibly uh, preemptively strike Russia as well. And, and what's interesting about Kennedy is that Kennedy had, up until this point in his presidency, not performed particularly well. He'd been sort of bullied into the Bay of Pigs invasion. He'd been manhandled by Khrushchev at Vienna, hadn't sort of really prepared sufficiently for this. He was proving to be sort of as middling as a president as he'd been as a, as a senator and as sort of a, a, a kind of a rich playboy. But I think what Kennedy reaches to in this moment is, is what he'd learned in the Navy, what he'd learned um, uh, in, in, in his uh, sort of harrowing ordeal as a, as a captain of, of PT Boat 109. Um, what, what Kennedy has the courage to do and the wisdom to do and the moderation to do is to slow this down. Even the fact that the missile crisis uh, transpires over 13 days is almost inconceivable in retrospect, right? Today, this would, ha this would be decided in like 13 seconds, right? That he slows this down, that he thinks about it. One of the first thing Kennedy does is now, today this would happen in the Situation Room, but Kennedy uh, convenes what he calls XCOM, which is his group of advisors. But he not only relies on the advice of the people who are paid to be his advisors, but he brings in ex-presidents, he brings in ex-secretary of defenses, ex Secretary of State, he wants as much advice as he possibly can before he makes a decision. Um, at one point, he leaves the room because he wants his people to be able to convene and discuss honestly, not tell him what he wants to hear. Um, but he also has the sort of courage to challenge conventional wisdom. He says, um, okay, if, I, if, if we attack, what is Russia going to do in response? And basically, the reply he gets is, well, we haven't thought that far in advance. Um, our job is to decide what we're going to do. But he says, no, there must have been a reason that the Russians did this. Why did they do it? And if we don't understand that, then we can't decide what the best course of action is for us. One of the other things I like that he says, um, he goes, I'm not worried about step two or step three or step four. He's like, I'm worried about step five, step six, step seven. I'm, I'm worried about where this escalates, right? And he says, I'm worried that some of the advice that you guys are giving me is so wrong that uh, no one will be around to say, I told you so. And so again, he's, he's able to slow this thing down. You can see some of the notes that Kennedy took during the missile crisis. I think they're really fascinating. You can see he's jotting to himself. He's writing missile, missile, missile. Uh, and an, on another one, he's writing diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomacy. He's writing consensus, consensus, consensus. He's sort of prioritizing, writing to himself the ideas that are uh, the, the sort of virtues that he wants to make these decisions by. Um, he draws a few pictures of sailboats to himself to calm down. Um, this, uh, so here he's writing NATO. He realizes very quickly um, that if the United States attacks another country, even if uh, it was more than justified in doing it, the perception of that is going to be really bad. So he thinks about how this move is going to be perceived internationally. So he begins to uh, bring in as many allies as possible. Um, he, uh, he takes a walk through the, Rose, uh, the White House Rose Garden several times. He actually later writes a letter to the White House Rose Gardener uh, thanking her for helping save humanity um, because she'd helped calm him down. He swims, right? He's, he's trying to clear his mind. He's trying to, 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 to think about this objectively as possible. And then clear, clearly he decides here that he's going to blockade Cuba. This is the decision that he makes. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, one of Kennedy's favorite expressions is he says, I want to use time as a tool and not as a couch. So the 13 days were not him waiting around hoping that someone would solve this problem for him. It was realizing that he, from his reading, the Russians had overreached. They made a move out of desperation. But he had to give them space to come to their senses. And he had to come up with some moves that would buy him space and time for uh, sanity to prevail. 
and that the, the longer he, st the more he could expand that space between stimulus and response, the better the outcome would potentially be. Um, and so uh, he sends, he, he, he puts together a, pres uh, a presentation on television uh, to the UN. Again, he's trying to bring the American people on board with this. He goes to both houses of Congress. Uh, both parties tell him, uh, we think you should bomb Cuba. So again, he has the courage to, to, to resist political pressure. He ignores the fact that this is uh, coming into an election year. Um, so to me, this is leadership embodied. This is the, the, four, uh, the four cardinal virtues embodied. Um, uh, and then he decides on the blockade that I was telling you about. But even the blockade, again, here is courage and discipline and moderation. He initially sets out uh, around a 500-mile blockade around Cuba, obviously uh, put forth by the US Navy. But he decides that block, the word blockade has an aggressive military connotation. So he calls it a quarantine. He's even thinking about how the move is going to be thought about by other people. And then the British inform him that they don't think that, they think 500 miles put into effect right now doesn't quite give the Russians time to turn their ships around. So he immediately shrinks it to 300 miles, right? And then even as the, the US and the USSR are eyeball to eyeball, as they say, even after a U-2 pilot is shot down, he sort of holds the line, he sticks to what he knows, and then suddenly and, 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 and inevitably, Khrushchev comes to his senses. We begin to telegram back and forth between each other. Um, and, and Khrushchev finally says, if, statesmen's, if statesmen don't learn to be wise, uh, we will clash like blind moles. He says, we're pulling at the, the, the rope of war and the, the knot will be only able to cut by a sword. So basically, Khrushchev, by, by, by seeing the example that Kennedy does, by taking advantage of the time that Kennedy does, by realizing also, I think this is important, that Kennedy is not backing down here. Uh, we're able to de-escalate this crisis. Um, actually, Kennedy's sort of guiding, uh, guiding principles in the missile crisis uh, come from a paragraph from the military strategist B.H. Liddell Hart. And I'll sort of run through them really quick. Hart said, uh, a leader must keep strong. They must keep cool. They must never corner an opponent, uh, always allow them to save face, he said. You must have unlimited patience. You must put yourself in their shoes. And I think this is the important thing when we're talking about virtue. It can so often feel like virtue is, is sort of weighty and judgmental and superior. Um, Hart says, avoid self-righteousness like the devil. Nothing is so self-blinding. And so in this missile crisis, what Kennedy is doing is embodying those four virtues in, in, in the real world. Uh, he's, he's stillness embodied, he's courage, he's courage embodied, he's wisdom and prudence embodied. And he, he, his sort of moderating influence allows us to, to, to de-escalate uh, ourselves or to walk back from the ledge of what could have been nuclear holocaust. And, and it allows him ultimately, I think, to do the right thing. History has been quite kind to Kennedy here over the missile crisis. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the cardinal virtues. This is why we have to do this work. And this is where Kennedy is able to get through, uh, through, through the kinds of, of, of thinking that we're talking about here. Um, this is a, a verse in the Tao Te Ching, which I think is sort of a perfect encapsulation of a, a leader in, in high stakes, high pressure situations. Careful as someone crossing over an iced over stream, alert as a warrior in enemy territory, courteous as a guest, fluid as melting ice, shapeable as a block of wood, receptive as a valley, clear as a glass of water. And actually this idea of, of letting a, a glass of water settle, like muddy water settle, um, is, a, is an image we see in Eastern and in Western philosophy. Um, I, I'm, I'm more of a Western philosophy guy myself, so I like this quote from Marcus Aurelius. He says, you must be like the rock that the waves are crashing over. It stands unmoved and the raging of the sea stills around it. And I think um, it, it's easy to think that Kennedy was just negotiating, but he's also unyielding and uncompromising. That he get His famous speech to the United States, he says, we, uh, to the US people during the missile crisis, he says, we learned in World War II, uh, in the run up to World War II, what happens when you appease and accommodate you know, naked aggression. So there was, uh, for, for all of what Kennedy was able to do, the behind the scenes deals he was willing to make, the diplomacy he was willing to make, uh, the, the, the counsels he was willing to take, there was underneath that uh, a rock hard commitment 
to what was non-negotiable, and that was that those missiles were going to go. And that's ultimately, I think, what the Russians had underestimated uh, because of Kennedy's weakness in the past. They assumed that um, he could be bullied into, into this compromise, which, of course, he wasn't. So what, how, how do we sort of apply these virtues in the real world? What are, I think, some easy ways to remember uh, uh, or sort of aphorisms that guide us? I think that's what we can run through. So uh, as, as they were saying, um, we don't control what happens to us. We control how we respond. This is the core tenet of Stoicism. The Stoics do uh, an exercise they call the dichotomy of control. They put uh, things in two buckets, what's up to us and what's not up to us. And they would say the vast majority of the things that happen are not up to us, but what is up to us is what uh, is this tiny little dot, and that's our response to all those other things, right? We don't control what happens. We always control how we respond. Um, I have this tattooed on my arm here. My reminder of it is, is that not only do we control how we respond, but that every response that we give is an opportunity to practice these virtues. So the Stoic goes through the world thinking, yes, I, have, I am uh, in some ways very powerless over all these things, but I have this superpower in that I am going to rise to the occasion when it is offered to me. Right? I am going to see these things as an opportunity to be uh, my best self. The, the other um, uh, virtue, erite, is, 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 translates as excellence. Right? It's an encompassing excellence of, of sort of moral and, and, and technical skill, but the idea of, of excellence, that everything is an opportunity to practice excellence in some form or another, is the sort of core tenet of Stoic philosophy. Um, we are nothing without training. One does not just magically perform the way that Kennedy did. Um, one does not uh, perform as Stockdale did under pressure without training. We have to work on this. Um, the FDNY has uh, this sign in many of their fire uh, houses. Let no man's ghost come back to say my training let me down. Um, if you are not practicing, if you are not training, eventually you will meet a situation in which this shortcut comes back to haunt you. So for the Stoics, philosophy was not this thing that you read one time or that you heard about one time or you attended a talk about one time, but an ongoing practice, an activity you're engaging in. So for Marcus Aurelius, this is journaling, this is discussions, this is writing, this is you know, actually going, okay, I'm, in the modern context, I'm stuck in traffic, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to practice what I believe. It, it, the training here is essential. And I think all elite performers understand the power and the importance of training. When you look at, at, at astronauts, particularly the early Apollo astronauts, as I talk about in The Obstacle is the Way, um, it was repeated, gradiated series of exposure to stressful events. The first time you hear a loud bang, the first time you hear the alarms go off, the first time you're subjected to these G-forces, you don't know how to react, you're not prepared to react, but each time you are exposed to it, you get a little bit better. And so again, this idea of the obstacle is the way. Um, you go through life, and when you are going through difficult circumstances, you can at least say to yourself, well, I'm getting some reps or I'm getting uh, experience dealing with this difficult thing. Um, the Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield is not that astronauts are braver than other people, they're just meticulously prepared. But this preparation is essential because you will experience uh, problems, things will go wrong, Murphy's Law is real. And he says that in a dangerous situation, there's all these things that you can do to make it better. Right? And so this is what you want to practice and train to be able to do. And then he says, it's worth remembering too, there's no problem so bad that you can't make it worse also. So uh, Kennedy could have made the missile crisis much worse, and we have seen leaders uh, for all time take difficult, vexing problems, and because of ego, because of emotional reactions, because of, all sort, because of a lack of training, make that bad problem worse. Um, uh, MacArthur at West Point, upon the fields of friendly, friendly strife are sown the seeds that upon other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. So it's, I think it's not just training in what you do in your actual occupation or your profession, but also looking for analogous um, <clears throat> opportunities to practice. I think sports are a great opportunity for this. I think hobbies are a great opportunity for this. Um, the first black female astronaut, Mae Jemison, um, she was a trained dancer, and she would talk about how her training as a dancer prepared her 
for the experiences of being an astronaut. Churchill was famously a painter. He actually even wrote a book about painting. And he painted from World War I all the way through the rest of his life. His paintings are in museums, not because he was a good painter, but because of what he learned and experienced, the peace and calmness, the, the, the presence, um, the, the sort of focus that he learned through exploring the hobby, right? So for me, uh, I, I run and swim. This is very different than what I do as a writer, but uh, when I am you know, knee deep in a book that's not going anywhere, I know from my practice in endurance sports that I have the ability to, to force myself to keep going. So this training can take a variety of forms. Um, ego is the enemy. This is a, a key idea when we talk about where sto uh, philosophical schools overlap. No philosophical school says ego is really good. Try to cultivate ego. Be an egomaniac. No, hubris is like the main thing that literature has been warning us against for all time. This is Napoleon about to invade Russia. As you know, it did not in end well. And then here's Hitler about to do the exact same thing. Here's the founder of WeWork about to destroy his company. Um, Cyr Cyril Connolly said, uh, whom the gods wish to destroy, they first call promising. And, uh, and, and, and so it's, you know, pride goeth before the fall. When you think you're as good as you can be, it's true. You stop getting better. Uh, when you think the rules don't apply to you, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is where you, uh, where you run into trouble. You know, uh, MacArthur, I could show you a photo of MacArthur about to cross the Eula River. Um, it, it, is, it is when we uh, ha believe that we are suddenly invincible, that everything we do uh, uh, turns to gold, that, that we end up destroying ourselves. Uh, ego destroys teams. Uh, this is Kyrie Irving and LeBron James. Kyrie Irving doesn't want LeBron James to come to Cleveland because he's going to have to share the ball. And then as they win a championship, he's thinking about being traded because LeBron is getting all the credit and the attention. Uh, and then he goes to Boston and destroys that team, and now will probably destroy the, the, the Nets, too. Uh, e ego, uh, Pat Riley says, the disease of me can destroy any winning team at any moment. Ego is the enemy. Um, it's, it's the enemy, as Epictetus said, um, because you can't learn that which you think you already know. Right when you, uh, you you can't be a part of a team if you think it's all about you. You can't deliver value or do a job for other people, which is what you guys do, which is what businesses do, if you think this is about you. No, what we are in the business of is is service of being of use, and and ego is the enemy of 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 that. Um, you always stay a student. Again, as I was saying, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. And when you look at wisdom, this idea of wisdom, the wisest man uh, who ever lived, according to the ancients, was Socrates. Why was Socrates considered so wise? Because Socrates was aware of his own ignorance, right? Socrates knew what he didn't know. Um, Socrates believed other people knew more than him, and that's why he went around Athens asking all those questions. He probably asked too many questions, made some enemies along the way. Um, but, but, but the point is, uh, you can't learn that what you think you already know. So you, you, you decide, I'm always going to focus on what I don't know. If you think about the scientific method, uh, it is based on the admission of ignorance. I don't know. I think X, but let's test, right? And so you learn by following curiosity. You learn by accepting ignorance and moving forward from there. C.S. Lewis, uh, talking about the Bible, he says, you know, wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You can't just be naive. You can't just be good. You also have to be aware of how the world operates. You have to be aware of the principles that the world operates. You know, it'd be nice if Machiavelli was wrong, but he's not. So you got to know what other, uh, what, what, the, what, the, what the forces or ideas that are, are sort of animating the world. So I would ask uh, everyone in this room, who are you learning from, right? Not just your teachers, but what sort of active path of studying and education are you currently on? What questions are you asking? Who are you asking those questions to? Specifically, I'd say, what books are you reading? I love this quote from General Mattis. He says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate. And, and what he means is, um, and he says this in Call Sign Chaos, which is a wonderful book, but he's saying um, human beings have been fighting on this planet and writing about it for a minimum of 5,000 years, right? And he says it's unconscionable, even criminal, for leaders to be learning by trial and error what has already been learned by other people. He says, if you're learning by trial and error, you're filling up body bags, 
uh, when, you, when you could just be reading books, right? And so uh, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate. There have been midshipmen who have written books about their experiences. That whatever job you want in the armed forces, people have written about that. Smart people have written about it. People who f***ed it up have written about it, right? You can learn from all different types of people. You want to learn from cautionary tales. You want to learn from inspirations. You want to read how-to books. You want to read history books. You want to drink deeply from this hard-won store of knowledge. Tolstoy says, I cannot understand people who can live without communicating with the wisest people who ever lived on Earth. This is what books provide us. But Twain, as always, says it better. Those who do not read have no advantage over those who cannot read. If you are not reading, you are essentially illiterate, right? It doesn't matter that you can, it matters are you doing it. I think books have been the best investment of my life as I was, as I was telling them at my table. My introduction to Stoicism came. I was at a conference like this, as uh, probably the exact same age as many of the midshipmen in this room, and I went up to the speaker, uh, the speaker afterwards and I asked for a book recommendation, and he recommended that I read Epictetus, Stockdale's favorite, and that the fact that he recommend I asked uh, positive step number one got the recommendation then read the recommendation right uh, this is the process by which we improve and get better um, that quiet time is essential um, you have to have time to reflect and think about these things right this is what that sort of training and inventory we're talking about is uh, Mattis again he says the single biggest problem of senior leadership in the information age is lack of reflection or lack of time to do reflection we're just reacting he says we need solitude to reflect on our decisions uh, and and rather than just reacting and I think this is what Kennedy embodied there in the missile crisis it would be so can you imagine being Kennedy uh, with CNN and Fox News and MSNBC in the background and he's tweeting back and forth with Khrushchev uh, you know, this is not going to end well. So we need to step back and think about these things uh, in, in, in the big picture. For me, my, my routine is sort of built around this. In the morning, I wake up very early, earlier than I have to. Uh, I sit down with uh, some journals and I sort of get my thoughts down on the page. Uh, I, I try to think about where I'm getting better, what I'm working on, what my intentions are. Then I take my two sons for a walk. We go outside. I don't use my phone for the first uh, 30 minutes to one hour that I'm awake sometimes as many as two or three hours into the day, because I want to wake up not on my back foot, right? So yes, that means I have to wake up before other people, I have to wake up before my responsibilities, but I want to do what's important for me to do at the beginning of the day, so then I can be reactive to the chaos for the rest of the day. Um, I would say uh, an important part of these virtues is that um, they are wonderful and lofty to talk about in the abstract, but uh, they, they, they can cost you, right? Um, and uh, what I think is so incredible about uh, John McCain, um, who I'm, I think we can see his, his grave there from the window, um, as he is in that same prison camp as, as, uh, as Stockdale, um, when, his, uh, when his captors realize who his father is, they give him an opportunity to leave. He could have left. Right? So it's easy to say, okay, look, I respect the rules. This is what I stand for. You know, these are all the, the, the things that I learned in school. You can pay lip service to these things. But here he is forced uh, to choose between those ideals, the people that he cares about, the people that he served with, and his own self-interest, his own freedom. And so he chooses essentially to voluntarily stay there. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about applying these ideas in the real world. Um, is it worth anything if it doesn't cost you, right? One of my favorite is, expressions is, it's not a principle until it costs you money, right? Uh, you can say it, but until you have skin in the game, until you're really willing to live it or believe it or sacrifice for it, what does it really mean? Um, this is a, a translator of Epictetus, uh, Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who in 1862, I believe he's from, from New England, uh, decides to apply his, um, you know, commitment to philosophy and freedom um, to, to leading a black regiment in the, for the, the Union cause in the Civil War. Philosophers are not just people who discourse about philosophy, the Stoics would remind us, but people who live by these things in the real world. Uh, this is Tyler Schultz, uh, if you're familiar with the Theranos story. Um, Tyler uh, Schultz is the person who brought uh, that whole scam or fraud down and he sacrificed quite greatly to his parents, and he had to mortgage their house 
to pay the legal bills to fight off the company as the company was attacking him and trying to, uh, to, to silence him. Uh, he, he even had to challenge his own grandfather, uh, who was on the board. Um, and, and so he, he, you know, he was willing to bet essentially everything to do what he thought was right. The Stoics would say that courage is the, is the virtue from which all these other things descend. You can't, it would be wonderful if doing the right thing was openly embraced and celebrated and everyone congratulated you for it, but often the world does the exact opposite, right? We don't like people who do the right thing. We don't like people who stand for what they believe in because they're often pesky, uh, because they often uh, are focused on a single thing. Like whistleblowers uh, uh, are only celebrated like years after the fact, but at the time, whistleblowers, uh, you know, uh, do not get treated well, as we have seen uh, recently, uh, which I won't go into. But uh, Marcus Aurelius famously, again, how do you do these things in the real world? It's not a principle if it doesn't cost you. One of my favorite stories about Marcus Aurelius, there's two quick ones. He's made emperor, and there's a problem. He has a stepbrother. What, is a, what do emperors do when there's a rival to the throne? Uh, yes, ex <laughs> exactly. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the only sovereign in all of history to anoint his rival co-emperor. The first thing he does with absolute power is give half of it away. Uh, it's incredible. This is what philosophy can prepare us to do. But my favorite story about Marcus Aurelius, he inherits a Roman Empire that's sort of laden with debt. Um, and so he walks around the imperial palace and starts picking out uh, treasures owned by the emperor that he sells on the palace lawn to pay down Rome's debts. He says, why should I levy a tax on the people? Why should I you know, start invade some foreign country? Why should I kick the can down the road when I could bear that burden myself? And this is, this is what I think leaders ultimately do. He says, just that you do the right thing, the rest doesn't matter, cold or warm, tired or well-rested, despised or honored. And I'd probably emphasize that last, that last part because unfortunately we don't honor people who do the right thing um, readily enough or quickly enough. In fact, we often do the opposite. Um, we are made for each other. The Stoics believed in the common good. They believed in service. They believed in this idea of uh, okeosis, the, the affinity for the larger group. They believed in this idea of sympathia, that we each had a role to play, however humble. The janitor and the general are both serving uh, instrumental roles in the operation of a school in a base like this. We each have a role, we're all important. What matters is how you do that role and, uh, and, and, and how you serve the larger entity. Marx really says, what's bad for the hive is bad for the bee and vice versa. Um, uh, and, and, and this also, like so on the one hand it means about being selfless, but it also means that all these people are on the same team as you, that this is a team sport, that these virtues, that this mission we're on is a team sport. He says, don't be ashamed to need help like a soldier storming a wall. You have a mission to accomplish, and if you've been wounded and you need a comrade to pull you up, so what? Um, the last thing I would say about this idea of sympathia, um, it's, a, it's a Greek proverb that I think has unfortunately gone out of style. Uh, but, but the, the Stoics would have been quite fond on it. They said, a society is great when people plant trees in whose shade they will never know, right? And so in a time where we are way too focused on right now, we're way too focused on getting ahead for ourselves, we're way too advanced, uh, you know, focused on immediate results. What a Stoic thinks about, what a philosopher thinks about, what these four virtues guide us towards, I think should be about uh, long-term about investing in this project that we are all a part of, in doing things um, for which you might not be ultimately the recipient of that good. If you think about the selfless service that you know, countless graduates, uh, or the selfless sacrifice that countless graduates of, of this school have been called to give, they didn't experience the benefit of that, right? Um, and in fact, their families experienced the loss of it, but society as a whole, uh, you know, uh, reaps, reaps the, the benefits of, of, of those sacrifices. And so um, it's about uh, not thinking about, uh, Marcus Aurelius talks, he says, you do a good deed, don't think about the third thing. The third thing is the recognition or the credit or the gratitude. You do it because it was needed and because you believed it was good. The third thing is extra, which you may or may not get. And by the way, the third thing is not in your control, so it's not worth prizing. 
Um, the last thing, and then I'll wrap up and go to questions. Uh, I think Stockdale's story itself is a wonderful embodiment of these four virtues. Um, when he's shot down out of his Skyhawk, um, he's parachuting down uh, into Vietnam. What fate awaits him? Um, death, possibly, you know, uh, horrible injury, quite likely. Um, uh, imprisonment, uh, almost certainly. Um, and he says to himself, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. He knows that, he literally says this, he knows that it's an opportunity to practice the philosophy that up until this point he's only sort of studied in the abstract. And he knows um, that he's going to be the highest ranking uh, uh, prisoner up until this point. And so he sees this as an opportunity to be a leader, to be a value, um, to be an inspiration for the, 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 the men down there. Um, and, and as he's taken prisoner in the Hanoi Hilton, he organizes what uh, we've come to call a culture of defiance against his captors. But I, I think that almost uh, undersells the magnitude of what he accomplished. Because for all the defiance, right, uh, he mortally wounds himself, so he can't be uh, used as propaganda. He attempts to kill himself at one point uh, rather than, than, than give in. This is all incredibly impressive, but I'm actually more impressed by the sort of culture of support that he creates inside this prison camp. He realizes that it's utterly unreasonable and unrealistic to expect no one to break under years of insane, uh, you know, uh, inhuman torture. And so he creates a, a code by which prisoners can communicate with each other, but not communicate to, to just be defiant, but to offer support to one another, to reassure one another. The watch where they would say US to each other as they would tap on the walls, US. And it's, that's not United States, it was unity over self. The idea that they were in this together, that they were part of something together, that they were there for each other. This is what I think philosophy is meant to have us do. So yes, the, the courage and the tenacity and the endurance is a huge part of that story. But I think in some ways it overshadows the, 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 the the sort of humanity of it, uh, the, the, uh, the, the selflessness of it, um, and, 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 the, um, and I think the real stoicism of it. Stoicism is not simply not feeling emotions. That's not what it is at all. Uh, stoicism is this code of values, this way of living. Um, he says, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted that not only would I get out, but also that I would prevail. And then in the end, I would turn the experience and the defining of, into the defining event of my life, uh, which in retrospect, I would not trade. We don't control what happens. We control how we respond. That's what Stockdale did. He said, not only am I going to stand up to this test, but I'm going to turn it into the defining uh, event of my life. And then again, I think overshadowed by his incredible military heroism and his example uh, and, and sort of inhuman endurance, is the role that his wife, Sybil, plays in this, right? It's hard for her, too. He's gone for seven years. It's hard for all the, the wives and families of, of, of POWs who are missing then and now. And so she throws, she sees this as an opportunity as well. She'd never been uh, particularly active in politics or anything like this. And she, she makes herself into a leader, into an ad advocate and an activist. She starts a, a, a POW organization. She lobbies Nixon and military leaders. Um, she pushes back against the, the policy at this time, which was to basically not acknowledge who these men were and what they were experiencing. She brings her husband's cause to the forefront. She fights not just for herself, but for everyone else in her position, and by extension, all the people who have come after her. The legacy of her work uh, lives on in this flag, which they created, which I'm sure you, have got, you guys have seen. And uh, you know, if, if it were ever to come to a point where one of you was in a position of being a POW, you would, be, you would have benefited, you will benefit from the work and the advocacy that this person did when she was um, subjected to what she was subjected to. So the Stoic knows, look, I don't control what happens, but I control what, uh, how I respond, that there's no situation so bad that it's not that it can be turned into good, but some good can come out of it. And I think that's what Stockdale was saying. It's not that he wanted to have endured what he endured. Um, it's not that he could put rose-colored glasses on and see it as a positive, but he could turn it into a defining life event um, for which he was, uh, would later be grateful. So I, I, if I could close, I would just say that this is a time that needs heroes more than ever in, in sort of all forms and, and, and functions. 
um, that this is an, that, that the difficulties and strife and, and, and conflict of our time is, is as, as alarming and in some ways depressing and discouraging as they are, they, they, the Stoic would uh, remind ourselves that, uh, would, would, would seek to remind us that it's an opportunity that, that the world has always looked like this in some form or another and that what matters is, is how people choose to respond to that. Um, the question today, as it's been for thousands of years, as it was for Epictetus as a prisoner, as it was for Stockdale as a prisoner of war, um, is just, uh, will, will you answer the call there's no situation that I think is not improved by these four virtues of, of courage and justice and temperance and wisdom. Um, the question, uh, as always, is whether we'll live up to them. And uh, the world is testing us in this way. The world is, is asking, uh, you know, do we have what it takes? Are we going to be brave enough to do the right thing? Are we going to live up to what we believe? And, 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 and can, we, can we prove these ideas with our conduct. I, I, was, I went for a run a couple years ago in, in Ragnor Township, Pennsylvania, and I, I was, it was snowy and cold, and I went through this um, Revolutionary War Cemetery, and there's all these uh, you know, cool uh, graves. This, this person died in 1777 in the midst of the Revolutionary War, but it was uh, this uh, gravestone that stopped me cold. This woman died in 1805, it was probably the least uh, uh, assuming of all the tombstones there. There were big, tall obelisks and you know, enormous crypts and, and, and beautifully uh, carved statues. And this one just lay on the ground, and it didn't say much. But it did say, uh, verses on tombstones are but idly spent. The living character is the monument. It's not what you say. It's what you do. It's not what you read. It's how you live. Uh, the Stoics would say, you could leave life right now at this very moment. Um, so let that determine what you do and say and think. Let that determine whether you answer that call, how you behave. Um, memento mori. I could close on that downer of a note. Uh, thank you very much. We, we'd like to open up uh, for some questions for just a few minutes. Yeah, and, as uh, much time as you guys want. Let's let uh, let's let the midshipmen lead on the questions. And I've got some uh, I've got some challenge coins uh, that I can give out to people who ask the first questions. If we need to prompt anyone. Get my water too. Nothing. Here we go. Um, so when you began speaking, you talked about the four virtues, and you used JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis as an example. During that, you kind of alluded to some of the other characteristics that JFK is known for as well. And I was curious how you reconcile like, those vices with pursuing this life of stoicism and sure. virtues that you said you have to like, practice every day. Yeah, so the unfortunate truth is that people are complicated, and that someone who could live up to an ideal in one facet of their life might be... Uh, sort of struggling with demons or problems in, a, in, an, in another. I, I typically try to look to where I can find inspiration uh, rather than, you know, just an easy place for judgment. But yeah, one of the, one of the most sort of alarming, strangest parts of the missile crisis is that uh, on one of those 13 days, you know, he buses in a college girl and he has an affair in a DC hotel room. And so, you know, he doesn't know whether he's going to live to see his family another day, and his priorities were clearly so skewed that he thought that was a reasonable thing to do, right, or that that wasn't a sort of a shameful thing. I mean, I think it's complicated and, and uh, you know, struggled clearly with some other issues and, and uh, you know, addictions, but um, people are complicated. We can be uh, excellent in one facet and, uh, you know, repugnant in another, I think, it's very hard to keep that compartmentalization going. Eventually, one kind of swallows up the other. So it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. Just come find me after. I'll give you the thing. Uh, sir, Midship and Glass Heiler. Hi. You mentioned the four virtues. You also mentioned that you feel courage is kind of the stem of all of them. I was hoping you might be able to elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. I think, well, it, you could, I think you could make the argument that they all uh, are impossible to separate from each other. How do you know 
what to be, well, how do you know what the right thing is? That comes from wisdom. How do you know how much courage is the right amount of courage? This comes from moderation. So I think they're, they're somewhat complicated, and difficult to, to, to break out from each other. But I, I do think doing the right thing, sort of living by your own sort of code of, of self-discipline, uh, you know, deciding to pursue, you know, education and knowledge over, you know, the things other people want, uh, raise. I, I think ultimately these things take great courage, and I think they're impossible to execute without courage, and in some ways are probably worthless without courage. Um, so I'm reading in a book right now written by a psychologist, and she wrote about how... Um, What's the book? It's called The Defining Decade. Okay. Um, but she wrote, one of the chapters was about how the decade of your 20s is when your amygdala is most hyperactive and that can lead you to like be very emotional in situations. So my question is, how do you recommend that um, the midshipmen in the room during this defining decade of in our 20s um, harness the powers of like acting on stoicism when our brains are in a very emotional state? Sure. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think uh, obviously in the ancient world, the Stoics had no understanding of biology or evolution or psychology. So we, we have the benefit now of more knowledge about these things. Um, if, if anything, I would say that because of those sort of, because of the hormones and because of the stress and because of the development that we're sort of going through throughout our life, but you know, from you know, your teenage years to your, uh, through your 20s, it's different. Um, this is precisely where this training and these sort of models of behavior to, to look to re are really important. Um, you could so easily make a mistake uh, out of you know, an emotional impulse or out of a insecurity or whatever that could shape the rest of your life. So that it's, the stakes are really high. Um, but I, I tend to think we, you know, uh, Alexander the Great conquered the world before he was through his 20s, right? Like pe people are clearly capable of doing things. So I think that one of the one of the things that one of the things I'm wary of is when when we're using sort of psychology or 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 um, you know sort of biology to sort of either rationalize or infantilize people. And at the end of the day, like you're responsible for yourself and uh, you got to own own your shit, you know. Good afternoon, Major Hi. Ryan Curry. Um, for those of us that help teach and influence uh, young people to try and embody some of these virtues, what, uh, in your experience, work with folks like, how do you combat the Kyrie Irving, right, <laughs> who's, who's uh, super talented and, and has so much potential, but then uh, gets in their own way with some of their own? Yeah, um, I think, so w one of the interesting things about ego is that it would be ridiculous to argue that there are not successful egotistical people. So we can kind of learn the wrong lesson from a Kanye West or a Steve Jobs or, or whatever. We go, oh, or, or even, you know, the founder of WeWork took like a billion dollar severance package for, you know, his failures, right? So you can look at that and go, oh, it works out. What I try to think about, what I think we do, is it requires a deeper understanding of the material, is to go, well, how much more successful could Steve Jobs have done, been had he, you know, been able to rein this in? Where, you know, like, so I think Kyrie Irving is a great example. It's like, how many rings did he and LeBron leave on the table because they weren't able to come together? So it's not that Kyrie Irving isn't a great basketball player. He doesn't put up great numbers. He's not rich and famous and, you know, living the life that he wants. But if you really asked him, like, what were you trying to accomplish? He would have said, you know, I want to be the greatest of my generation. I want to win this many times. Well, okay, now let's look at how this has served you. And, and so... Um, look, Steve Jobs should have been fired from Apple the first time. Like, he deserved it. Like, any leader in this room would have fired him because he was totally unmanageable. He's doing a terrible job. And, and it was only because of the work that he went off and did and because of some lucky breaks that he was able to come back. And, you know, history, uh, the second chances are the exception, not the rule, right? And so I think we can, we can look at these things and go, oh... And I think anyone who's been around successful leaders or you know uh, people in their fields, the people are in their direct 
circle know all the ways that they get in their own way. And, and oftentimes those things are kept secret, but we, we sort of have to study and, and, and realize, oh, yeah, you, you might get most of what you want, but you will ultimately, the thing you really want more than anything, you'll probably prevent yourself from having. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, sir, I believe that uh, people are inherently selfish and that goes with leaders as well. Um, so speaking about self, uh, selflessness, selflessness in leadership, um, do you believe that leaders uh, sacrifice like wholly in the name of their followers or because they're looking to fulfill an inner ideal uh, or get some respect or some recognition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it again goes to what I was talking about earlier. Like, sure, there's lots of evidence that people are inherently selfish. We do stupid, you know, uh, short term, you know, things that benefit only us. But then, you know, history is also replete with beautiful examples of sacrifice and selflessness and things that made no logical, rational sense that, that people did. I think part of that's training, but I also think, you know, the Stoics would say that the Stoics would disagree with this idea of original sin, that we are inherently flawed or broken. They say that actually we all are inclined towards virtue, that we have this. What happens is that stuff gets in the way. Either we learn the wrong lessons or we prioritize the wrong things or, um, you know, we, we, um, we drift away from what we know is right. And so, yeah, look, I think people are, I think there is a selfishness in humanity. And I think, you know, if you're trying to put things in place that go directly against people's incentives or self-interest, you're going to have a lot of trouble. One of the, the great laws in the 48 Laws of Power is, you know, it says never appeal to mercy or gratitude, always appeal to self-interest. Which just means, strategically, you want your things to go with people's nature, not against it. But at the same time, I wouldn't underestimate, you know, humanity's, uh, you know, uh, tendency to surprise us by, by uh, you know, doing the right thing as well. Well, Mr. Holliday, uh, thank you for sharing with us your insights. It's it was just remarkable. Thank you. And uh, we are an institution of... Uh, of mariners, and mariners at sea uh, have the four cardinal points of north, south, east, and west. And I think it aligns somewhat to the, the cardinal virtues that, uh, that you were talking about. So on behalf of the Stockdale Center and beha on behalf of all of us here today, we'd like you oh, to wow, have one you. of our uh, Naval Academy compasses. And uh, oh, we, we hope that that would sit out somewhere that would be on display. It absolutely will. And uh, for the midshipmen who offered uh, questions, uh, you could yeah. either see uh, Mr. Holliday, or we'll have some up here, so you, you'll have that ability. But uh, yeah, thank you for helping thank us so with much. our moral compass. Appreciate, appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. And for all of you, uh, what a, what a joy-filled time this has been. Thank you uh, as uh, Naval Academy participants and our wonderful guests. We're grateful for your attendance. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Karen Ornberg. Uh, Karen, can you just hold up your hand over there, please? Uh, she's our senior staff assistant. And, and uh, Sarah, Sarah White. Sarah, would you please raise your hand? Without them, we could not do this. So thank you for making this possible. Everyone will quickly receive this afternoon in the mail a request for you to fill out a kind of an after, uh, after action summary of, of this experience. And uh, we'd like you to respond to that request. And we'll also give you a link to the photos that will be available, should be available late this evening. So use that link today or tomorrow. Because uh, first of all, we want and value your comments. And second of all, we'd like you to have a, a memory of today. As you depart also, you'll, you'll receive another memory. Uh, we'll, each of us will receive a gift of, of Mr. Holliday's book called uh, Stillness is the Key. And I'm not sure, do we have that? on any arms yet, but uh, uh, yeah. there we go. Okay, so if you'd like it with a photo of the tat or an autographed copy, uh, we can do that because uh, it, um, Mr. Holliday's approach to uh, mind and body and spirit uh, really ties into our mission of the Naval Academy of uh, moral, mental, and physical. So uh, if, again, if you'd like an autographed copy, you, you just probably stand in the queue toward the door where the books are, and we will be more than happy to offer that to you. And if you would please, uh, if everybody has uh, your name tag, we
we'd like to recycle those if that's okay. So simply leave your name tag on the table or the exit uh, table as you leave at the welcome table as you go out. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, God bless America. Uh, God bless each one of you. And uh, may all of us exemplify uh, our virtues of courage, honor, and commitment. Thank you.